At Online Med Ed, we walk you through every topic in detail so you're ready for the boards and the wards. There's been a lot of changes in the DSM-5 regarding catatonia. What I want to do first is talk about catatonia in general, how you identify it, or the different variants of catatonia, what it is, and then use it as a launch point to talk about some of the more dangerous life-threatening diseases that may mimic malignant catatonia. Let's start off with catatonia first. It's a big change is that catatonia in and of itself is no longer a disease. It is not a disorder. It is instead a modifier of, a, of another illness. And it doesn't even have to be psychiatric. One of the big changes was that we used to call a subtype of schizophrenia catatonic schizophrenia. Well, it turns out that schizophrenia isn't even the most common disorder that exhibits catatonia. In regards to modifying a psychiatric illness, mood disorders like depression, bipolar disorders like mania, are far more likely to have catatonia than is schizophrenia. And as you'll see with the retarded and excited symptoms, they play very well into depressed mood, depressed movement, retarded symptoms, manic mood, manic movement, excited symptoms. So it makes sense that catatonia would occur more often in mood bipolar disorders than in schizophrenia, but it's a big change because now there is no more catatonic schizophrenia. It's schizophrenia with catatonia, but it's far less likely than major depressive disorder with catatonia. It can exist with medical disease, autoimmune disorders, perineoplastic, or nutritional, but I want you to associate catatonia with psychiatry. The reason being is because one, it's more likely to be seen in psychiatric illness, and two, we're going to use a pattern of is there a psychiatric disease and what medication are they on to separate the four disorders at the end of this lesson. For simplicity, catatonia is a modifier of psychiatric illness, more likely to be mood and bipolar, depression, mania. Let's define catatonia. It is defined by having three or more of the following symptoms. Now, of course, there can be crossover between these two disease states, but I find it very easy to separate retarded catatonia from excited catatonia and think of them as two completely separate disorders. I'm going to color code them that way. Retarded catatonia is sort of the decreased movement symptoms. They move less, they do less. Excited catatonia is where everything is going more. They are more active, they're doing things, they're saying things, and they're doing more than they're supposed to. Retarded symptoms include stupor, they're altered, catalepsy, which is really annoying because narcolepsy suffers from cataplexy, not the same suffix, loss of tone. Catatonia has catalepsy, which allows the patient to be put in whatever position you want. You literally can put them anywhere and they will just stay there. But they're not limp. They have this waxy, waxy meaning somewhat rigid or stiff, flexibility. You can put them into any position, but it's hard to get there. They have this resistance. And they'll exhibit some sort of negativism. They will, there's resistance to movement, and, they just, and they're also resistant to commands, and they may just not speak, which is mutism. On the other hand, excited symptoms are going to be things where they just keep going. You're going to see things like stereotypy, where they'll do the same purposeless movement over and over and over again, like just pat their arm or tap their knees, grimace their mouth or snap their fingers. Agitation and grimace are the same line item. They don't count twice. And then there's going to be the things where they copy. When they copy what you say, it's called echolalia. When they copy what you do, it's echopraxia. And this is not the patient being annoying or trying to antagonizing you by repeating the same words you just said. It's literally a disease state that's compelling them to do it. The diagnosis is clinical, but because the rezepam works so well at treating it, 
what you do is you give the treatment lorazepam, and if it goes away, your diagnosis is done. The treatment, if it happens again, is lorazepam, short-acting intravenous benzodiazepines. But because the patient could be in one spot and not move, or just do repetitive motions that don't help, they may not eat. What you have to watch out for is malnutrition. Track their albumin, and you may need to give enteral or parenteral nutrition while they come out of the catatonia. Because they're not moving, they're at risk for DVT, so you'll need to use low molecular weight heparin or pneumatic compression devices if they're hospitalized, even in the psychiatric ward, which usually you don't do because the patient's moving around. And because they're laying there, just like the old lady who falls in her house alone, it's three days before anyone checks on her, she can end up with rhabdo. She'll need to renal failure, check for an elevated CK. And it's here is where I want to stop and jump off and talk about drug-induced catatonia and discuss the different presentations of those medication-induced disorders. Catatonia, modifier for psychiatric illness, retarded symptoms where they don't move at all, but you can put them in whatever position you want, excited symptoms where they're going to copy you and just do the things that are completely useless that don't help them, treat it with lorazepam. But there's a form we haven't talked about, and that is going to be malignant catatonia. And it's the first of the four disorders that I want to compare against. What you're looking for is the precipitant that led to the disorder and the symptoms of the disorder. This all goes under the category of drug-induced catatonia, sort of. What's cool about this chart is that the symptoms for every one of these disorders are exactly the same. What you're going to see is a combination of rigidity and a dysfunctional autonomic nervous system. In the way of rigidity, what you're going to see is what's described as a lead pipe rigidity. All the muscles are contracted at once, such that the person's basically going to start shaking because they're basically contracting everything at the same time. This rigidity and contraction of the muscle leads to muscle breakdown, which will show it in the way of an elevated CK. And they have very strong resistance to movement because they're simply contracting everything. Autonomic dysfunction is going to manifest as a revving up of the autonomic nervous system. You're going to see an elevated heart rate, elevated blood pressure, and most importantly, an elevated temperature. Not all fevers are infection. So if you see a fever in a patient who is a psych patient, you may still rule out infection. Get a history, chest x-ray, your analysis, make sure it's not an infection and you need to start antibiotics. But if you see the combination of rigidity, elevated blood pressure and heart rate, and an elevated temperature, and psychs on board, you might want to think about these diseases. So these, are, these symptoms are present in all four. Malignant catatonia is catatonia, just that's gotten really bad, which means that you will have a psychiatric disease, but there's no medication that caused it Malignant catatonia can happen without a precipitant medication. If instead you're talking about neuroleptic malignant syndrome, you are still going to have lead pipe rigidity, elevated temperature, elevated blood pressure, elevated CK. If there's going to be a psychiatric illness, it's usually psychotic disorders, but the patient is going to be on antipsychotics. If you see this syndrome and antipsychotics, it's NMS. Serotonin syndrome, this one should be pretty easy. Lead pipe rigidity, elevated CK, heart rate, blood pressure, temperature. There's going to be a psychiatric disease, and it's usually going to be mood, anxiety, and they're being treated with SSRIs. The last one on the list has nothing to do with psychiatry at all, but it's still drug-induced. That is going to be malignant, there's that word again, hyperthermia. Malignant hyperthermia has the same symptoms, but now you've been exposed to anesthesia, usually halothane gas. There's no psychiatric disorder, which is why you're going to ask the patient before they go to surgery, do you have a family history of reactions? anesthesia. 
what you're going for, or one of the things you're going for, is are you at risk for malignant hyperthermia and should I have dantrolene standing by? Catatonia, not its own disease, it's a modifier. Retarded slows down, excited speeds up, lorazepam. Watch out for complications. When you get into drug-induced catatonia, look for rigidity, lead pipe rigidity, elevated CK, elevated temp. If you see psychiatric illness without medications, well then catatonia. Psychiatric disease with antipsychotics, NMS. Psychiatric disease with SSRI, serotonin syndrome. Nothing to do with psychiatry at all, and they're in the operating room getting anesthesia, malignant hyperthermia. On the test, they have to make it one-to-one. -one. They have to show you which one it could be. In real life, you might have someone on an SSRI and a psychotic, and you have to take them off both. The answer on the test is to stop the offending agent. For malignant hyperthermia, the answer is definitely going to be dantrolene. That is catatonia.